to the Sex and Psychology Podcast. My name is Dr. Justin Lay Miller. I am a social psychologist and research fellow at the Kinsey Institute and author of the book, Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Help You Improve Your Sex Life. On today's episode, I'm going to be speaking with sex therapist Shadeen Francis. Shadeen is a licensed psychotherapist, media personality, and author whose work spans the domains of sex therapy, emotional intelligence, and social justice. Shadeen is committed to helping people live lives full of peace and pleasure, and her work has been featured extensively in the media. Today, we're going to be talking about the intersection of sex and social justice. We will explore topics such as how power and privilege play out in the context of a therapy session, how clinicians' own identities and experiences can shape their therapeutic approach, as well as how putting social justice front and center can help all of us to live more pleasurable and fulfilling sex lives. We're also going to explore some sexual taboos and talk about how to reduce sexual shame. I can't wait to dive into this conversation, so let's get to it. Hi, Shadeen, and welcome to the Sex and Psychology Podcast. Hi, Justin. Thank you for having me. The last time we talked, you and I were both guests on the NPR program Radio Times, and we were talking about COVID-19 and how that's impacting sex and relationships. And I knew then that I definitely wanted to have you on my podcast because you had all of these great insights and you presented them in such a compelling way. So I'm super excited to have you here and to continue the conversation. (laughs) I'm so glad that we were able to connect over there. Me too. It was a lot of fun. So to get started, can you tell us a little bit about your own professional journey? I'm always curious how people get into sex therapy and relationship therapy, what motivated them in the first place. Um, you know, I get I get asked this question a lot myself. And I always used to say no one grows up thinking they want to be a sex therapist, you know, from the time they're young. But I did actually meet someone recently who's in training to be a sex therapist who said she knew from the age of 12 that she wanted to be a sex therapist because she saw the movie uh, Meet the Fockers, the, the sequel to Meet the Parents. <laughs> <laughs> and she said Bar- Barbara Streisand's portrayal of a sex therapist is uh, just what inspired her to want to get into the field. Now, I think that's <laughs> you know not the path that most of us take. We were all inspired by Barbara, and we didn't know from such a young age. So tell us a little bit about your path. How did you get into this world? <laughs> I mean, didn't we all kind of want to be Barbara Streisand in some form or fashion growing up? Um, kind of. I mean, some of us still do. So <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, I think it's I, I think it's a really uh, fun question, and it's really interesting being in this line of work because people don't really ask like an accountant or like a lawyer like what made you want to do that. Uh, but once once you have maybe a less traditional career, uh, people are always fascinated. You know, like what would convince you that sex was, you know. Uh, an employable uh, profession, but <laughs> I'm actually more similar to, you know, the the person that you recently connected with. I also, I was around that age when I decided I wanted to do this. I wasn't allowed to watch Meet the Fockers. But <laughs> however, I had a, a sort of similar, in some ways, experience. So I was being babysat um, by, you know, at, at the time we regarded them as the best babysitter uh, in hindsight, probably not so great. They essentially didn't do a ton of supervision. And so we would use, we would use all of our unsupervised times. It was, it was me and and two others. Uh, We would use that unsupervised time to watch all of the shows that we weren't allowed to watch at home. So like Beavis and Butthead and like the early, you know, seasons of the Simpsons, you know, all all like the quality TV, of course, Mm -hmm. for, you know, for an 11 year old mind. So this was like the summer before seventh grade, and uh, I was raised Caribbean. Uh, for folks who are the children of immigrants, you might relate to this story really deeply, and and there might be others who also have this experience. But you know, very early on, the significance of education was really, really pushed uh, and really, really named in my family. And so what I took that to mean was that I had to already have it figured out and you know, well-meaning adults would ask all the time, like, oh, so like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I I took that to mean like, oh shit, I'm supposed to already know what I'm doing. <laughs> and really my only plan at that time was to join the X-Men. 
Uh, and I felt very seriously about it. And because I was super nerdy and had, you know, a, an engineering father, he just sort of let me uh, continue with that fantasy and bought me books. And I would just study and research. And over time, I realized, like, shit, I might be a normie because uh, I was doing all sorts of things. I was practicing my telekinesis and my powers were just not manifesting. Um, <laughs> and so I actually had, you know, I, I got my quarter life crisis out of the way. I've been I've sailed pretty smooth. I sailed pretty smoothly through my 20s uh, because I got that out of the way at like 11 when I was like, shit, what am I doing with my life? I have to figure this out. And so the summer before the seventh grade, I was like, okay, like I need to have a plan before school starts because the seventh grade is when you start, you know, really applying yourself so you get into a good high school. And then the courses that you take in high school then allow you to get into university. So I got to have a plan now. Uh, and so late one night, connecting this back to the babysitter story. So late one night, we're scrolling the TV and we end up at an episode of Talk Sex with Sue as an idea of how, just how late night we're talking, right? So, um, quality babysitting. And someone happened to call in. I still remember a lot of details about the episode. It was like an episode on anal. I had no idea what they were talking about. Kids were still like blowing up condoms as balloons, uh, as like pranks at school. So I had no idea like what was going on, but the caller calls in and says, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say, thank you so much for your work. You saved my life. And so for me, in the middle of my, you know, existential professional 11-year-old crisis, I was like, okay, great. I'll just do this. Like, whatever. <laughs> she, right? Like, she's helping people. She's in the comfort of this really cozy, swagged out room. She obviously likes what she's doing. Right? You apparently can do it forever because, you know, she, you know, had been on for a long time um, and was an older woman. And so I thought, great. Like, I'll just do this. And truthfully, I just fully committed. I didn't have a backup, like sex therapy was my backup plan. Uh, and so I didn't have a plan C. <laughs> so, so here I am. I, you know, organized the rest of my life around this work. So by the time I was in high school, I was already, you know, volunteering in mental health clinics and doing like peer ed work. By the time I was in university, I biased, I got a neuroscience degree, but I wrote almost every paper I could on sex. So like one of my like seminar theses was on like the evolutionary significance of fetishes. Like I, I really committed to this work. <laughs> Apparently so. So I've been doing this. It feels like I've been doing this for a very long time. <laughs> well, it's funny. We, I, we apparently have a lot in common because I wanted to be an X fan too when I was yes. uh, young, and I read all the comics, and I, I still have them around the house somewhere. Oh, I love that. And I also love that you were inspired by Sue Johansson. I used to watch Sex Talk with Sue as well, and it's funny. Mm -hmm. My mom, my mom is the one who introduced me to the show. Wow. <laughs> she used to watch it late at night with my dad. She just stumbled onto it once accidentally and just thought that it was so great and entertaining and educational. And so she's the one who turned me onto it. And I know that she's inspired just generations of people to go into this field. So that's I love great that to hear. positive lineage. Look at that. The power <laughs> of parents. We love it. We do. And I'm fortunate to have a family that is, you know, very accepting of the work that I do and mm. they're proud of me and don't try to hide it. So I, I think that that's great, but not everybody yeah. has that experience. And, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of sex therapists where, you know, they kind of hide what they do from their family. And so they kind of have to go through this whole process of how do I come out as a sex therapist to yeah. my conservative family? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can absolutely be a whole process. I didn't have a lot of time to think about that. I have a younger brother and we got into an argument. Um, so he outed me over breakfast one day <laughs> uh, while I was, while I was, you know, still in school, um, sort of deciding on the details of, of, you know, my, my degree. So I didn't really have to think a whole lot about it because it, it came out. And so that's, that's some of our experiences, but I, I'm also really fortunate that even though it, you know, took them a while to understand what my work is, I also have super supportive parents. So even if they don't necessarily want to talk the details, uh, about all of the work that I do. <laughs> I also feel really, really grateful that they've always been in my corner. That's great to hear. So your current work really explores the intersection of sex therapy and social justice. So let me ask you the question of what social justice means in the context of sex therapy and why is it important for us to talk about social justice when we talk about sex in general? Yeah, 
Justice is such a huge, such a huge topic. And so what I might even just center for the sake of our conversation might be like the frame of power, the frame of power. I like conversations about power. I like difficult conversations. And so when I think about how the sort of theme of justice is relevant to sex through the lens of power, thinking about in our sexual experiences, like who has power, right? Who has claimed power and what is the impact on all of our lived experiences? So in sex, most people are trying to access things like presence or safety or connection or freedom. And those are all things that we would house under the umbrella of like feeling empowered, right? The, the capacity to make an informed and uncoerced decision. And that's so relevant to all of the interactions that we have in the world, whether that's our relationship to self, whether that's our relationship to our partners, whether that's our relationship to our community, whether that's our relationship to our government or to the land that we're on. And so when people talk about sex, it's so hard for me to hear or to think about it, um, without thinking about how people are actually in relationship to themselves and to one another, right? These dynamics right, of power. It's so hard for me to think of them as isolated incidences because if someone is to come into my office and talk about something that feels so deeply personal, like receiving a shame-fueled comment from someone on the internet, that is making them question, you know, is my sexuality okay? Is it normal? Are my behaviors, you know, valid? Is my, you know, identity acceptable? That's not actually just a person to person interaction, right? We're being influenced by culture, by policy, by education. And I don't think the healing work actually comes from us divesting or, or separating people from the context of where they were harmed. I think we actually are called, especially as, you know, maybe people who might call ourselves as healers or as educators, as therapists, right? I, I think we are called into an advocacy role in helping not just talk to the individual, but I think we actually have a responsibility to our larger social structure, right? to, to our larger culture. Absolutely. I love that answer and the way that you think about and, and approach sex. And it, it, it very much fits with the view that I have as well, which I, I always take what we call a biopsychosocial approach to mm -hmm. talking about sex, where you have to look at sex through different levels of analysis at the same time. So you have to consider the uh, biological factors that play a role, the uh, potential evolutionary factors, and then also look at the individual and their personality and their lived experiences, but then also look at it through the lens of the broader culture and society in which they're embedded. And all of these things come together to shape our sexuality in very complex ways. And we can't just yeah. look at one factor and ignore all of the others because sex is is inherently complex. But something I want to talk about that relates to this is kind of the way that sex therapists are trained and mm -hmm. how that influences their approach to sex therapy. I'm someone who's very much involved in the education and training of current and future sex therapists. In fact, I spent several years as a faculty member in a counseling psychology doctoral program where mm -hmm. I taught courses on sex and relationships. I also work with a number of organizations that provide continuing education courses for sex therapists. I think actually you do some of this as well. And I think I we've, we've, taught, we've taught for some of the same programs. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I've learned through all of this is that Many of the people who are out there practicing sex therapy haven't received much sex education themselves. And yeah. as one example of this, when I was working in that counseling psychology department, we had literally one class in that four-year program on wow. sex, marriage, relationships. And how can you expect somebody who's going to be out there on the front lines dealing with questions about sex and relationships every day to be equipped to answer them when they have just the yeah. single one semester course. And I worry that the lack of sex ed for sex therapists contributes to a lot of the inequalities that we see in the administration of sex therapy because it creates this opportunity for personal biases to creep into therapy sessions and it creates an opportunity for an individual's own identities and experiences to be the primary things that shape 
their approach. So can you speak a little bit to this in terms of what ways you think the training of therapists might be failing us when it comes to pursuing social justice in the world of, of sex therapy? Yeah, you know, I resonate so much with that. I, I feel that so much. You know, my early experiences teaching I wasn't belonging to a program in particular, but I started teaching uh, at my alma mater at uh, Jefferson University. It, it funnels a, a lot of science, a lot of med students. And so the program or the department that I was teaching within was a school of interprofessional education, which I got so much value from when I was a graduate student because there was a program in which you would actually work on a medical team. So there was five to seven of us, depending on just like what the group size was, but there was like a marriage and family therapist in training, right? So all of us were, you know, interns. So a marriage and family therapist, there was someone in OT, there was someone in PT, there was a med student and a pharmacy student, and sometimes someone who was going into like nurse practitioner, right? So it's this array of folks with different lenses on health, and we would work with members of the community and strategize around their health needs. And so when I graduated and had the opportunity to offer like courses and workshops for this program, I was doing them on sex because, right, I, I already told you, I biased everything on sex because I decided when I was 11, like, this is my way to contribute to the world. <laughs> and my, my workshops, they would fill up instantly, right? Instantly, I would, we would open the booking at noon and by 10 minutes in, they were already filled. And these were like 60 to 200 seats every time. And people really want this information because, for example, like the students in medical school, they were getting like eight hours in their entire program. Like imagine that, right? You have a four-year education plus residency, et cetera, et cetera. And you're only guaranteed at that time, right? This is a number of years ago now, but at that time they were only guaranteed eight classes. Yep. Right. And so then I think about my experiences, the experiences of my clients going in to say their, you know, OBGYN or to the urologist or to their primary care doctor to talk about a concern and not being met with grace or with compassion or with advice that feels helpful or humanizing. Right. And I don't blame the providers for that, but we, we do have such a need for education. We have such a deep need for education. And so where do we get it? And I think that, you know, to, to get back to answering the core of your question, like, what do we do moving forward? I recognize that, you know, they're not going to like that I said this. School is a business. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, rec I recognize that, you know, our, our institutions of, of higher ed are a business and there are limitations and they're dealing with accreditation and trying to fit in so much content quite often and not a lot of time, right? Like two years, three years, four years still isn't quite so much time to think about sexuality from like birth to end of life, plus all of the other things that we might be called to do in our unique professions. And so I think what our responsibility will be as clinicians is to recognize that we are lifelong learners and we are required to be lifelong learners and that we will need to continue to pursue education, even if the structures that exist don't give us everything a la carte, right, that or, or sort of put together, you know, that we might need to start doing some of this a la carte, we might start to need to customize our educational experiences, knowing that we no longer can just rest on the laurels of, I went to school, and so I, and so I know everything that I need to know. I think we yeah. need to continuing to pursue more education. And that might be outside of the formal system, right? Are we willing to join communities? Are we willing to engage in forums, right? Like social media right now is such a beautiful exchange of information, totally overwhelming, but there's a lot of information that's just out there in the world. People are creating content and giving it away constantly for free, you know, around the exact things that we are seeking to help our clients around. And they might not be showing sort of evidence-based practice methodologies, but they might give us deep insights into what does it mean to be in an interracial relationship? What does it mean to have kinky proclivities? You know, what is someone who is struggling with depression like thinking about and what's their sense of humor like? Like what TikToks and memes <laughs> are they creating on Instagram page? What are they asking in forums? You know, it, we I think we have to consider the world from a place of, of curiosity still. Yeah, everything you said is, is so true. And I'm glad you brought up the lack of education for physicians, because that's absolutely a, a, a big problem. Because yeah. 
people are going to their doctors with questions about sex, expecting their doctors to really be uh, their primary source of information. For example, if they experience a sexual difficulty or when it comes to something like STI testing and, you know, sort of knowing who should get tested and when, um, yeah. we know that a lot of doctors aren't asking the right questions. In some cases, they're making assumptions about their clients. For example, right. it's all it's often the case that a doctor will not offer STI testing or talk about that with a client who's married because yeah. the assumption is that everybody who's married is monogamous and so they don't need to worry about testing. And so, so there's so much room for sex ed to be improved, not just in the world of sex therapy, but also in medicine and, and elsewhere. I would also love to add that even for folks who are sex therapists, I really want to encourage all of us to remember that we also have our hands in the role of education, right? So much of our work is education, right? Psychoeducation. And so we actually need to continue to learn, right? And not a lot of us learned much about sex ed through our clinical training, right? We learned about, you know, how to help people therapeutically, but we still didn't, you know, go back and learn some of the things that we could have learned, you know, in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade about anatomy, about how bodies work. I cannot tell you how many clients that the work has been so, so brief because I effectively or essentially am telling them like, that's actually just not how bodies work, yeah. <laughs> right? And I say it more compassionately than that most times, right? But like expectations that you're just supposed to like, my partner, you know, doesn't love me because, you know, her vulva isn't wet, like, you know, when we start to have sex, right? Like, and just to be able to name, like, that's not actually how bodies work. Right. Or I feel, you know, like my penis should look like this or should do this or right. And and just being able to teach people things. Sometimes that's the most heartbreaking piece of my work to connect with people who've carried around so much pain and shame over just like basic information that were, they were never given or they were given inaccurate misinformation. And, and so I love your work um, for that in, in so much, because especially around fantasies, by being able to even just normalize, like, hey, you are represented in this list of top seven, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Like, and there's many more than this, but, you know, this fantasy that you have so much shame around, like, look at the the ratio, look at how many people are also thinking what you're thinking or feeling what you're feeling. And yeah, your story is unique and special and designed for you, but you are not alone and you are okay, I, I think it's it's so true what you say about how so much of sex therapy is really just sex education because people never got the information that they they should have received earlier on. And, you know, I think that's a pretty common misconception is that, you know, I, I think there's sort of this assumption or stereotype of when somebody walks into the sex therapy office and all immediately becomes this deep psychotherapy. And it's so much <laughs> time. It's, it's really yeah. correcting those myths and misconceptions. And, you know, I know that as a sex educator, one of the most common questions I get from people who write into my website or when they come up to me after a, a talk that I've given or uh, approach me at a bar after <laughs> <medical, laughs> it's that question of, am I normal? And, yeah. you know, I think that's, I'm guessing, probably one of the most common questions you get too. But yeah. so I want to ask, what does the term normal mean to you when it comes mm -hmm. to sex? And how would you encourage people to think about this term and maybe redefine normal so that it can help ultimately to reduce sexual shame and help to empower people to live happier and healthier sex lives? Yeah, that's such a good question. Uh, normal, truthfully, doesn't mean a ton to me personally <laughs> anymore. It's language that I use because it's the way that I meet the folks that I work with. I gave up on normal a really long time ago, which was why the X-Men made total sense, right? I was obviously a mutant. Uh, sure. And so normal no longer applied. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about normal. Um, but, but at this stage, you know, when I, when I think about normal, normal is frequency data, right? Like normal is, you know, sort of average. And so I invite people to consider that normal actually isn't a judgment on right or wrong or good or not good or better or worse. Like normal is just what is common, mm -hmm. right? And so common can be safe uh, in that like no one's going to call you out for anything in particular. Normal can be dangerous, right? So we can think about things like, you know, ways in which we fail to show up for or stand up for things that need to change. 
We've had a lot of really gruesome things be normal in our cultures. No matter what culture you, you belong to, every community has normalized some things that actually need to be revisited um, and revised and reformed or, you know, completely eliminated. Right. And so I just invite people to consider beyond what is normal, even if we were to, you know, and, and I, I give people dignity and answer their questions. Right. I'm not going to gaslight people and say, like, why is that important to you? Which, you know, sometimes people are encouraged to do. Right. That's actually guidance that some therapists get. Right. That if a client asks you a question that you don't want to answer or that you don't think is the right question. Right. Then you put it back on them and probe them about why they're even asking that. But I, I honor people's dignity and, and allow them to have answers to their curiosities. But beyond normal, like, like, what do you want? Right. Connecting back to desire, right? Sex, you know, often is around like concerns around desire. And so returning to like, what actually do you want? What feels good to you? So arousal, like what actually feels good on your body? Right? What feels good on your spirit? What feels good on your relationships? Moving into the couple spaces, what do you, what do you want to negotiate? How are we attending to consent around those things? How do we plan a, a life or a scene together? How can we maintain accountability for one another? Who's supporting us? So bringing that out to community, right? Who are we around? Who makes us feel like we are worthy and valid and valuable, right? And so we, we go from sort of that center point of normal, okay, like what happens already that is common? And then we expand it out to like, what is actually significant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that answer and the way that you think about this because it, it aligns very much with the way that I talk about the word normal when I'm discussing sexual fantasies. You know, normal is, you know, it, it's a wide range and it really just sort yeah. of looks at what is more versus less common. And essentially, that's right. all we're talking about there. And just because something is common, say in the world of sexual fantasies, like just because a sexual fantasy is common, that doesn't mean that it would be healthy to act upon it. And right. just because the fantasy is uncommon doesn't mean that it would be unhealthy to act upon it. And so we need to kind of get away from just kind of always measuring ourselves up with these yardsticks of what is normal and, and making right. these broad sweeping value judgments based on that. Yeah, but we're so desperate for belonging, right? We're we're wired for connection. And so, you know, normal is the way that we were taught that that we belong, right? That we don't make a lot of space for, you know, for nuance, for fluidity, for diversity, you know, for for difference, right? We we cling to, you know, sameness is how we get accepted, right? Sameness means that we're safe and we're lovable, right? Like look at the ways we need to distinguish like what is kinky or not, right? Like who got to decide that, right? Who gets to decide what is, you know, alternative or unusual behavior, right? Someone's like most extreme kink is someone else's Tuesday afternoon, right? right? But who right, who gets to decide, you know, what what is in or out? And I think that if we didn't have so many cultural mores around, you know, excluding people or shaming people, right? And and I, I still hold a line at harm, right? I, I still hold a line at, okay, anything that crosses over into violence or harm, right, is still a no-go. But anything before that, anything that is consensual and, and pleasurable for whomever is involved, I, I think that if we did less, you know, policing around you know, what is good or not good in that arena, I think people's, I think what we would see as normal would change, right? Because even if you were to look at, you know, things like divorce, right? Or anal sex, right? Like there's so many things that were taboo or unheard of that when you give people the choice, all of a sudden we realize a lot of people would like to consider things that maybe were off the table of actually acting on. Mm -hmm. And what you're speaking to there is that the the role that shame plays in shaping our sexuality when we keep trying to compare ourselves to what everybody else is doing. And I see this in my own research when people feel like their sexual fantasies or interests are uncommon, then they start to feel more shame about it. And then it becomes harder for them to talk about what they want with their partners. And that can create a whole host of problems in their sex lives and relationships. But since you brought up the, the subject of kink and alternative sexuality, I mm -hmm. wanted to take a second to dive into that. 
And specifically to talk about a topic I've gotten a lot of questions about lately, which is this idea of what's called race play, where it's a form of sexual role play, where people are essentially eroticizing oppression, where the real or imagined racial background of one or more persons is used to to kind of create this power imbalance in a BDSM scene. And this can take a lot of different forms from a black, white, master slave scenario to a Jewish concentration camp prisoner with a Nazi guard. But regardless of the specific form, race play is considered to be one of the ultimate taboos. And the sheer idea of it makes a lot of people really uncomfortable. And in my experience, it seems pretty common for people who have this fantasy to feel some degree of shame about it because they abhor racism in the real world. But eroticizing oppression in their fantasies kind of makes them feel like a hypocrite, right? Mm -hmm. There's sort of this mismatch between their ideals and values and then what it is that turns them on. And I've also heard from many people who have had a partner who's expressed the fantasy like this, but they don't know what to do with it or how to feel about it because they don't want to shame or judge their partner. But at the same time, they just don't want to go there in terms of acting on something like that. So can you Tell us a little bit or talk to us a little bit about this idea of race play and how you might counsel people who have a lot of shame about sexual fantasies where they're eroticizing power differentials. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, there's there's so much there. A little bit. Let me start with actually defining some of the ways that I think about things. So the first word that's coming to my mind right now is oppression. And so the way that I think about oppression is about being malicious or unjust with your power. So having sort of total unwavering authority over another person or group of people. And so like, that's not cute for sex. Um, Mm -hmm. right? When we think about consent, right, that we actually don't want someone to have total unwavering power over another person right? That a system of oppression, you know, doesn't actually allow uh, escape, right? That you cannot reverse your consent. It is not freely given. You don't have choice or agency. You are restricted, right? From from movement, you don't get access to information. That's one of the key ways uh, that systems or societies colonize or oppress folks, right? They limit their access to information. That's why, you know, invading parties burn libraries. That's why, you know, they burned witches, which is held, you know, indigenous knowledge, right? So oppression is not what we want. However, power dynamics, power exchanges are totally fair within the realm of kink, right? That, that is a, what a, a lot of kinks are about, in a sense, right? This exchange, this consensual, intentional exchange of power. And we can role play that along many different dimensions. And so I think it's important for folks to be clear that if they are saying, I want to engage in race play, what they're saying is, I want to enter into a power exchange dynamic or power exchange fantasy, either solely in the context of sex or broadened out into the larger scope of our relationship, in which we are role playing the division of power as being a result of insert identity in blank, right? So in the case of race play on the dimensions of race, right? However, these are roles that we're playing and they might mirror some of the identities that we hold you know, in our day-to-day lives, but that this is fantasy play, right? This is, this is fantasy play. And so we are not exploiting one another, We're not marginalizing one another, or this would be kind of in a one-way direction, right? So the person who is, you know, saying I'm going to be sort of the the dom in this exchange, right? Or if they're playing with terms like master-slave, then the master in this, you know, exchange. Right? This is not about exploitation. It's not about marginalization. It's not about imperialism, right? That the other party still maintains their consent, and their agency to opt out at any point in time and that all of the terms still need to be negotiated in as in any other kink scene, right? Even if it's some degree of consensual non-consent, right? I've still consented for you to not ask me before X, Y, Z things happen. Um, and we still need ways to opt out because that is how we distinguish between what is agreed and air quotes, you know, 
I'm going to use the word real. It's clumsy in this in this setting, but I'm, it's the word that's coming to mind right now. What is real and what is you know kink? What is chosen? What is consensual? Does that mm-hmm. does that make sense? Am I am I being clear with that? Absolutely. I think that's actually probably <laughs> the best description and framing I've ever heard for race play. So I think <laughs> you're you're totally on point in that. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about something related to this the since you mentioned consensual non-consent you know lots of people have fantasies about forced sex sex Mm -hmm. being forced on them in some way and some people call them rape fantasies which Mm -hmm. is a term i don't like because these fantasies bear no resemblance to a real world sexual assault but they're still fundamentally about some exchange of power And this is another fantasy where increasingly I've gotten questions from people where they feel morally conflicted about being turned on by the idea of for sex or playing with power while at the same time wanting to be vocal supporters of Me Too Mm -hmm. and to believe and support victims of sexual violence. And I'm curious if that's something you've encountered in your work as a sex therapist. Do you? deal with many people who kind of have this discrepancy between what turns them on and then feel conflicted about it because it it doesn't line up with their personal values and ideals. Yeah. Yeah. I see that a lot. And even if it's not specific to this type of fantasy, like the the cohort of folks that um, makes up the majority of my practice are like kinky, poly, queer, millennial, creative, self-defined weirdos, leftist, radical, right? Like, right. There's a particular (laughs) kind of umbrella um, of folks who um, fill my practice a lot. I think sometimes that's about just sort of how they see me and find me and get to know me. I think also I live in Philadelphia. So (laughs) I think some of the population is, is, is biased in that sense, but yeah, you know, there's a lot of shame around wanting what we want, especially when it feels like it is at odds with our political ideologies, with our, you know, sort of moral beliefs, with our like religious affiliations or cultural practices. And I think especially when it comes to something that might mimic or resemble harm, right, very real harm that exists in the world, sexual violence is very real. I think that people are really afraid uh, of what that means, right? Everyone is really worried because they don't want to be, you know, most people don't want to be someone who causes harm. Most people do not want to be seen as abusive or or a, as a perpetrator. And so I continuously remind people about the frame of consent, right? I continuously remind people that fantasy, right? So even if they are fantasizing about it, right, that there's a difference between things that increase the arousal in your body and things that you actually want to act on or plan to act on, right? You are allowed to have all sorts of fantasies, right? And you get to choose what you actually do. I think if your fantasies are causing you deep conflict, I think there's room for us to decide how much or little we actually engage with those fantasies, Right. And how we can sort of practice some degree of, like, yes, self-compassion, but also some like mindfulness, right? Some awareness of like when I'm sort of entering that fantasy space and can I exercise some not self, you know, deprecating or, or shaming restrictions, but allowing myself to redirect my attention mm-hmm. to sort of other things that might also be arousing And if this is something that we want to engage with, how do we set up these scenes in a way that feels safe for everyone? Because for folks who are wanting to sort of, you know, be um, the aggressor in the scene, and I I shift language, right, or the initiator in the scene, right, that, that they have a lot of risks involved, right, to their own sense of self, to their own morality, to their own, right, like there are risks there. And then also for the person who's the recipient, right, the person who is playing the role of the person who's being approached. Right, that that there can be risks there, especially depending on what all of our histories are around around trauma. But I, I I also remind folks that some of some of what we are wanting out of sex is for healing. Right, there are the things that you know we fantasize about or desire or are interested in because they meet some unmet need, right? There's some feeling that we're trying to access. And sometimes that feeling, you know, is about having control, 
And so even if you have a fantasy of someone, you know, taking advantage of you sexually and that has happened to you in a painful way, there can be something healing about repetition with agency, Mm -hmm. right? Like there, there's, you know, some of what makes trauma so difficult is that we don't get a chance to integrate because it was an overwhelming experience that was unplanned, right? Well, this is planned. And it might not be so overwhelming because there are parameters, right? I have agency. I still have room to say stop or no more, or I can navigate it differently, right? Or I could have this experience with someone who will end the scene in a way that is loving and caring and compassionate or whatever it is that I want to get out of this experience. And so I I, I want to make room, um, yeah, for folks to not hold it in. I, I don't think there's a lot of value in sitting in the shame I think we decide what we want to do with it. If we want to act it out, let's find a safe way to do it. You know, in in this context, there are some things that, you know, that that don't quite meet, right? There are things that if it's just about violence, right, we're not, we're not creating safety, you know, to be violent, um, right? But if, if there are things that could be potentially painful or consensually painful, let's, let's create some safe container to do it. And if you really don't want to do it, Let's let's find ways to make some peace with the parts of you that still are aroused by it and find ways for you to sit with yourself differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've said it before and I'll say it again, that our sexual fantasies are in many ways therapeutic. Sometimes yeah. they're ways that we come to cope with a, a trauma that we've experienced or a way that we try to meet some unfulfilled or unmet sexual or emotional need. And so there's a lot that our fantasies can do for us. But when we get all tied up in the shame of our fantasies, then that really holds us back and it's psychologically distressing. And we need to find ways to allow people to unburden themselves and to help them explore exactly what you're talking about, which is that, you know, just because you have a fantasy about something doesn't mean that you actually have to go out and do that and act on it in the same way that it plays out in your head. And it's okay to have a fantasy that is not politically correct because most of us are turned on by the idea of doing something that we're not supposed to do, right? The the taboo is very erotically appealing. And, you know, since you mentioned that you work with a lot of people on the the left (laughs) uh, of the political spectrum, You know, I have found there are big political differences in our sexual fantasies and that people on the left are actually more turned on by BDSM and, you know, these types of scenarios where they're playing with power differentials. And I think part of the appeal there is because people on the left tend to believe in these ideals of equality and a level playing field. And so when you're playing with power differentials, you're really playing with a big taboo there. But then that also leads to why a lot of folks on that side might have more moral conflicts or concerns about, well, these are my values and this is what I'm turned on by and how do I reconcile this and what does it mean for me and what does it say about me? So yeah, I just, I love and resonate (laughs) with everything that you're talking about. I love that so much. So we're running kind of short on time, but there's one other topic I wanted to get into briefly, which is kind of how putting social justice more front and center in sex therapy can help us all to have more pleasurable and and fulfilling sex lives. What what do you think about that? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, that's the short answer. Uh, The short answer is yes. Yeah, I think that my frame, again, first, you know, goes to like the larger social structure. And I think that there are so many ways in which we have received messages, lived within structures that have really removed us, I think, from our access to pleasure, our access to feeling whole or deserving or worthy. And for many of us, like safe, right? Even safe, if we were to think about, I often use like Maslow's hierarchy of needs as just like a, an easy visual, um, you know, for us to consider, right? There are so many of us who in, in the world, not just in this country, who are really just struggling to hang on to that bottom level, that base level of literal survival, right? Like clean water, fresh air, regular access to food and shelter. Um, and so if we were to acknowledge that That is not like just personal shortcomings, that these are also structural, these are largely structural, then our connection to pleasure is not just healing, 
right? But it's also a form of resistance, right? That if a lot of these systems were designed to, right, like oppression is about limit of access, right? And so if these were systems were designed in order to create a hierarchy around our access to the things on, you know, this this hierarchy of needs, for example, if, if they were designed to keep us from accessing this equally and freely, then our ability to practice pleasure or to work towards pleasure or even to maintain, despite everything else, the belief that we are deserving of pleasure, right, is a beautiful and powerful and transformative act of resistance. And that's not just on the dimension of race. We can think about ability and development. We can think about the access of sex or orientation or gender or, you know, class or ethnicity or nationality, right? There's so many systems that are constantly at play, giving us messages and structuring our lives around hierarchy these people get and you don't get these people have access to rest and autonomy and vulnerability and education and consent and political rights and care right all of these things that i house under the umbrella of pleasure right that our constant pursuit of it our constant seeking of it our constant championing that we we deserve it and we want it and we will work towards it um, I, I think changes the way our entire world looks. And ultimately, I hope that it changes the way we all feel. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is beautifully put and a great place to leave it. Um, so thank you so much for this important and interesting conversation. It was an absolute pleasure to have you here. If you could, please tell my listeners where they can go to learn more about your work. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for, for having me, fellow X-Men future recruit. Uh, <laughs> uh, if anyone would like to stay connected uh, with me, you can find me on my website, Shadeen Francis, S as in Sam, H A D E E N. Francis.com. Uh, I also am available in theory on Instagram. Uh, I post my thoughts there, but also when there are things happening, I will also tend to put a, a shout out there or a link there. So if you are a person who is on Instagram, you can find me at Shadeen Francis LMFT on Instagram. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and your insights and just I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you too to my listeners. To keep up with new episodes of the podcast, you can visit my website, Sex and Psychology at sexandpsychology.com or subscribe on Apple, where I hope you'll take a moment to rate and review the podcast. Also, be sure to check out my book, Tell Me What You Want, which explores the science of sexual fantasies and a lot of the taboo interests that we talked about today and will give you a lot of informative and interesting interesting ways to think about your own fantasies. So thank you again for listening. Until next time.